My name is Kristen Thorne, and I'm the Long Island correspondent for Channel 7 Eyewitness News. If you've been to this event, you've seen me every year for the past six years, so I'm very happy to be here. In addition, another surprise, I have Joe Tesoro, my photographer here for Channel 7, so it will be on tonight. Uh, there will be, uh, you know, it, you'll see some of your beautiful faces on there. We'll do some of the vendors. Um, I don't know what time yet, but hopefully by later on this morning, I may have an answer for you. But it will be between 4 and 6.30 p.m. tonight. So we're happy to do that as well. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. The, this is the 2018 Annual Breast Cancer Summit. Breast Reconstruction Awareness, or BRA Day, is an initiative designed to promote education, awareness, and access regarding post-mastectomy breast reconstruction. This initiative is a collaborative effort between the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, the Plastic Surgery Foundation, and plastic surgeons specializing in breast surgery. BRA Day occurs annually on the third Wednesday of October. We know that's not today. But we're all here today in the spirit of what BRA Day embodies, and that's education. We are taking it one step further and will not only be talking about breast reconstruction after cancer, but exploring hereditary cancer, balancing work and cancer, optimal nutrition for breast health and cancer care, and sharing stories of survival. Throughout today's program, we encourage you to ask questions, to network, and take advantage of all the wonderful um, vendors and information in the room. Yes, there's a wealth of information available online, but by being here today, patients, survivors, and family members can obtain both authoritative information and interaction with the experts. All of the presentations you're about to see will be filmed. An edited version of today's program will be available to you on the event website, breastcancersummit.com, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with already. Help us spread the word. You're welcome to take advantage of this. This is just fantastic. I've never seen millennials. It's amazing. This wonderful Instagram cutouts. I, I am taking a picture of this and sending this to our web department because I have never seen anything like this. And the intern, is she here? The intern who came up with this? Well, anyway, this is Kate, Kate Muller. Kate Muller, this is, this is amazing. Did I say her last name wrong? Anyway, okay. So anyway. Point being, come take a picture with this Instagram cutout. Essentially, you know, this is wonderful. We're, we're all here, we're learning a lot, but we want everyone else to learn a lot. Not everyone can be here today. We're fortunate enough that we can. So we encourage you throughout um, the morning, when there's breaks, we're gonna have various breaks, come take a picture, Instagram. I mean, you can put it anywhere. It's obviously an Instagram cutout, but you can put it anywhere. So that's just to spread awareness about what everyone is learning here today. When posting to social media, you can use the event hashtag Breast Cancer Summit. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Roger Simpson to the podium. Dr. Simpson is the president of Long Island Plastic Surgical Group, the founding organization of this event. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Especially, we want to thank our vendors as well. Long Island Plastic Surgical Group is proud to sponsor and produce this annual event. As Kristen has just told you, it's our hope that you come away with the resources and information to best guide your treatment and breast cancer experience, whether that is as a survivor or a caregiver. The goal of this event is to open the conversation and empower our attendees, you in the audience, with the knowledge needed to make the best choices for your care. Our surgeons work with many breast cancer patients and survivors, and we are acutely aware of the need for greater access to information in this population. Our keynote speaker today, Dee Dee Ricks, chronic uh, chronicled her breast cancer journey with the HBO documentary, The Education of Dee Dee Ricks, which debuted in 2011. Since then, Dee Dee has given over 100 keynote addresses to Fortune 500 companies, foundations, nonprofit organizations, both domestically and internationally. And we're very excited to have her here today to tell her story. We couldn't agree with her more. In the past 20 years, we've seen positive changes in legislation regarding breast cancer and breast cancer education. The Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 1998 required that all health plans that offer breast cancer coverage to also provide breast reconstruction and prostheses. And just a few years ago, Mandatory education about availability and coverage for breast reconstruction and other available post-mastectomy alternatives was signed into federal law 
uh, via the Breast Cancer Patient Education Act. And we hope that legislation on both the national and state level continues to support breast cancer education and all access to care. And on the topic of legislation this morning, we have the pleasure of having Nassau County Executive Laura Curran with us. County Executive Curran was sworn into office on January 1 of this year. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Laura Curran. Thank you so much for inviting me to join with you this morning, and good morning. So, today, we are gearing up for October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And it's great to see so many people here, because it all happens with you. Uh, I want you to know that Nassau County is doing its part. We have our team over here. Say hello, team, Nassau. Uh, our Deputy County Executive for Health and Human Services, Kyle Rose Lauder. and Dr. Larry Eisenstein, who runs our health department. And I just have to brag, under Dr. Eisenstein's leadership, Nassau County's health department was just recognized as the best health department of its size in the entire country, not just in the state, but in the nation. So it's a real feather in our cap, and I could not be more proud. We also have with us Jerry Barish. Many of you, I'm sure, know Jerry and her advocacy. And I can't believe it's 20 years to the month that she started One in Nine Hewlett House, giving help, giving solace, networking for, for cancer survivors, cancer victims, and their families for these 20 years. Seems like it's gone by in a blink of an eye, but she has touched so many lives. And you will hear from her shortly and hear her story. So I think everyone here is pretty much in the know. We know that this year, 2018, all over this country, 250,000 women will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. How do we bring that number down? The same answers, regular screening, early detection, timely treatment. And it's our job to get that out there, to let as many people know as possible, get screened. I know I need to hear that myself. And if you have, if you do, you know, if you are diagnosed, get the right treatment, get it early. On October 17th, at, at the county seat in Mineola, you know, we've got that lovely, beautiful dome. We're going to be doing the Glow of Hope ceremony. We're going to light the dome pink. It's going to be a wonderful ceremony. I would love for you all to come. It's going to be at 6 o'clock on October 17th. More importantly, we'll be shining our light, but we need you to continue shining your light and working hard. Thank you very much. And I just have to give a shout out to Kristen. Not only is she beautiful, she's a fabulous reporter. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can I get an exclusive on something? Absolutely. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> hold you to that. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I know she said, you look so beautiful today. I said, I know, because I don't, I, you know, let's be honest, when you're a field reporter, you don't often dress like this. But I, I had a little bit of a problem this morning when I spoke, Joe will like to hear this. I spoke to my manager and he said, yeah, after the, um, this event, you know, there's some more rain that may be coming in. And there was that massive flooding in Port Jefferson. So he said, we may be sending you there. And I, um, I said, that, that's going to be a problem. And he said, why? I said, because I, I, I meant to pack rain gear, but I didn't. And he said, well, we're going to have to figure that out. So um, maybe doing a target run, or I have the rain boots, but you have extra stuff. Okay, I'll throw that on. I don't know. Anyway, you'll see me later maybe standing in who knows what. Okay, At the, moving on. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Pankaj Singhal. Dr. Singhal is the chairman of Obstetrics and Gynecology Women's Health Initiatives for Catholic Health Services and the chief of gynecologic oncology for Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we are still in September. September 29th? Yes. 29th, right? This is uh, 26. I lost track of time. So September is National Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month, right before October. 
So that's uh, Breast Awareness um, National um, Month. I'm a GYN oncologist, so I specialize in taking care of gynecologic cancer. But uh, over the last 10 years, breast cancer and ovarian cancer and prevention, they go hand in hand. So today, I'll take uh, this time to speak about ovarian cancer that is uh, very dear uh, to me, and how does it impact um, prevention, um, survival, uh, in context of breast cancer. Um, I have some uh, photographs uh, from my patients, and also surgical photographs I have permission to display today. Uh, there are two or three pictures which are a little bit graphic, so if I have permission from the room, those are surgical pictures. And um, organizing committee, thank you for inviting me. This is an honor for me to be here. Um, the first and foremost, I have no conflicts uh, to disclose. I don't own any stocks. I don't take any lunch or dinners from pharmaceutical companies. I'm a full-time salaried employee of Catholic Health Services of Long Island. Um, we will talk about only three things today. <clears throat> Those three things are going to be prevention, detection, and, and treatment. Everybody can hear me in the background, right? No? Okay. Right. So when we talk about ovarian cancer from audience, who do you think in this picture has ovarian cancer? Anyone? Any guess? That's a great answer. It doesn't discriminate who you are. This, point, this patient uh, on this uh, is a laser, laser, laser. Sorry. So this patient over here, uh, her name is Andrea Martinez. She came to me with a weekend flight from London. She had some yeast infection, went to her OBGYN doctor, and they found she has a mass, some pelvic mass. Thereafter, uh, we diagnosed her with stage four ovarian cancer. She was at the time 42, 43. She was. She was negative for BRCA mutation, um, underwent about nine hours of surgery. It was a very, very extensive operation. And then she on, went on, lived for about five years. She and I we became very close throughout this journey. And uh, this is uh, her five days she was in ICU. There was a big incision you can imagine. She had uh, diaphragmatic dissection, spleen, and, and I can just keep going on and on. We were there for about nine hours. This is uh, three weeks after surgery, and this, she's ready to start chemotherapy. <clears throat> and we know chemotherapy for ovarian cancer is very similar to breast cancer. Uh, they do need six cycles of chemotherapy treatment, quite extensive, hair loss, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, tiredness, so forth. This is, uh, she had uh, this picture taken after second chemotherapy treatment. This is after third chemotherapy treatment, and mindful she has stage four um, ovarian cancer. This is, uh, you can imagine she loves partying, so after four cycle of chemotherapy treatment, nothing stopped her from going out, friends, family. This is Christmas, her son and her friend. This is uh, after completion of all chemotherapy treatment. There was a huge party. This is uh, post-chemo uh, celebration. In uh, Buffalo, I was in practicing for about 10 years in Buffalo. This is, uh, we have what is called Saleta Run. So everyone, male, female, they have to wear high heels and run for about two miles. <laughs> and after, uh, so they call Saleta Run. Um, so she invited me, and, and uh, that was the first time I wore high heels, and it's not easy to run. <laughs> so when you talk about cancer statistics, uh, uh, one in every two men in the United States and one of every three women will receive a cancer diagnosis in the country in their lifetime. Currently, cancer is the number two cause of death in the United States. However, it is projected to surpass heart disease as number one over the next decade. Cancer is number one cause of death by disease in children. Currently, we have more than 14 million survivors, cancer survivors in the United States. So survivorship has really become a front focus of uh, all the specialists dealing with cancer. We used to believe back in 2000, before 2010, 
five-year survival for all cancers for about 68%, but right now, I mean, it was 49%, but now it's 68%, 70%. So cancer is, is, is not uh, end of all. It can be cured. It can cause long-term survivorship. However, we have legislation here uh, on cancer spending is roughly about 5% of all the medical care spending in the country, and it is the second leading cause of death in the country. So we do need more funding for research development. Um, this is a slide. Uh, we talk about all causes of death. And if you look at number two, is all malignant neoplasm. Currently, heart disease is the number one. But over this decade, we expect this will surpass. <clears throat> I'll switch gears here. We'll talk a little bit about uh, gynecologic cancer. The most common gynecologic cancer is uterine cancer. And the reason we're talking about uterine cancer here today is patients who have taken tamoxifen, um, they do have increased risk of developing uterine cancer. Patients who have BRCA mutation and they take tamoxifen, they have even exaggerated increased risk of developing uterine cancer. So patients on tamoxifen, if they have slightest bleeding, they should seek care uh, with OBGYN physician and have a biopsy. Uh, Second most common cancer is ovarian cancer, and the others are small numbers, vulvar cancer, and, and, and so forth. But when we talk about death from cancer, the most deadly disease is ovarian cancer. So most than half of the patient will die from ovarian cancer. Uterine cancer is highly curable if detected in early time. And the most problem with uterine cancer is they have bleeding that leads to a biopsy and diagnosis. However, ovarian cancer most of the time it is asymptomatic, means patients do not have any symptom. And we'll talk about that a little bit. When you talk about ovarian cancer statistics, this is the most recent statistics. Uh, we have 22,240 new cases diagnosed every year. And as we talked about, about half of them will die of disease. It's, it's very uh, deathly. And worldwide, there's about more than 200,000, leading to about half of those patients will not make. I like this slide. Um, and the reason, you know, we talk about so much funding has gone into breast cancer, gynecology cancer, research development, early detection prevention. This is before a lot of us, 1971, if you look at the number of cases every single year. It doesn't matter how much money we have spent, every single year. Starting 1993, 21,000, 22,000, 20,000, 25,000, and the number of death has been exactly almost 50%. We have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars for early detection. Nothing has shown for ovarian cancer um, to be effective. At present, we have no screening strategies. We have no mammograms. We have no MRI scans. We have no ultrasound, no blood tests that can detect early stage ovarian cancer. When we talk about uh, distribution, majority of the patients with ovarian cancers are diagnosed stage three and stage four. So about two thirds, about 75% are diagnosed about stage three and four. And that's because there's no symptoms. They feel pretty good. Before I moved to Long Island about two and a half years ago, the last operation I did for ovarian cancer, um, husband was eminent professor of ophthalmology, he went for skiing in Colorado, came back, and within two weeks the abdomen is distended and um, diagnosed with cancer about three weeks before they were skiing in Colorado Bowl. So asymptomatic, uh, and that's the reason is early stage cancers you picked up by accident. For example, somebody's having uh, appendix operation or cyst that you pick up by accident over in cancer. This is uh, the slide I just, I was early morning, I got up at six o'clock, I was putting together. Uh, it is National Ovarian um, Cancer Awareness Month and 22,000 patients will be diagnosed, 14,000 dead. Uh, risk of lifetime of ovarian cancer is about one in 78. Um, so be mindful of this. When we talk about survivorship, again, if you pick up early stages, is highly curable. My stage three and four is not so. So when we talk about switching gears, now prevention. <clears throat> we talk about family history. I was trained at Rosal Park, where Gilda Radner registry was developed, and that's led to all the family history now. So I do talk about whether you or I myself don't speak to your siblings, parents, whatever the family dynamics are. It's really important to know your family history, to ask about what's going on. Um, have they been diagnosed? Anything has changed 
um, because that can impact your own health. When we talk about breast and ovarian cancer, we talk about hand in hand. We have two different major syndromes. We talk about Lynch syndrome and BRCA mutation. BRCA mutation has a lot of attention. This slide uh, still holds true. When we look at breast cancer mutation, general population is about 2% by age 50. By age 70 is about 8%. Um, and the breast cancer risk goes from 50 to 80, 87%. Ovarian cancer also goes hand in hand. And general population is about 1 in 78, less than 1% or 1.2% we code. But it can be as high as up to 44% risk. And keep in mind, for ovarian cancer, we have no screening strategy. We have none so ever. So when we talk about family history, and I hope I'm not repeating myself again and again, but if a patient comes to my office and she has no history of personal history of breast and ovarian cancer, and we switch to family history, no history of breast cancer, but they have ovarian cancer less than 50, based on that, the risk that you may have a BRCA mutation is about 2.8%, and that goes higher and higher. If you look at breast cancer, less than 50, but no ovarian cancer versus ovarian cancer and breast cancer, any family member. So if you keep going down, if patient herself has breast cancer or ovarian cancer, the risk goes really high. So if you can remember, we have 5.6%, 17%, and 21%, but Eastern European and Ashkenazi Jewish population, those numbers are double because of the founder mutation. So just based on the family history alone, you could uh, predict the likelihood of carrying a genetic mutation. And, and that's really important. It takes less than two minutes for a physician to go over this history. And it's important for everyone to know their family members, what is happening with them. Hey, anything new has happened. And Thanksgiving is a perfect time. Um, endometrial cancer risk is also increased in um, um, Lynch syndrome, so is colorectal cancer. Um, same thing is ovarian cancer is also increased in, in Lynch syndrome or HNPCC and gastric cancer. I'm going to switch gears here. We kept talking about that there is no symptoms, patients who have ovarian cancer. Most of the time, they have no symptom. That's not necessarily true. Um, majority of the patients, they have had symptoms for up to one year before they were diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And those symptoms are so nonspecific, there's nothing to do with gynecologic issues at all. They may have bowel habit changes. They may have constipation, diarrhea. They may have acid reflux. They have had colonoscopies. They have had endoscopies. For up to one year before they were diagnosed, they have urinary symptoms. They go to the bathroom all the time. They have had urinary treatment infection for about five, six times. They had cystoscopies. Um, they may have nonspecific pain. They just think they're putting on weight, but it's all the fluid in the abdomen. So they have symptoms, but they're very nonspecific. Anytime you have someone has gastrointestinal symptoms, change in bowel habits, feeling full after eating food, acid reflux, urinary issues, they go to the bathroom all the time, and they have multiple urinary infections treated with no documentation of bacteria, they had cystoscopies, that's a major red flag, major, major red flag. And those patients have symptoms up to one year before they were diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So if, if you bring up these symptoms to your physician and they do not listen to you, I would suggest find a different physician. In this case, you do need further testing, at least ultrasound, CT scans, blood tests, clinical exam, and have a very close follow-up. Those are very non-specific symptoms. This is typical, you will see, Patient is in Colorado three weeks skiing, and boom, within two, three weeks, the belly is distended. And this is primarily because of fluid in the abdomen that is made by cancer. How does it spread cancer? It's very, very common. It starts in the ovary or fallopian tube. Then it can spread throughout the abdomen. Most common place is diaphragm. You will find, you will find bowel blockages, bowel obstructions, uh, but that's really far down the road. And that's the reason when they have implants or tumor on the stomach, it causes acid reflux. They may have tumor uh, spots on the bladder. Uh, that may cause urinary frequency that they have urge to go to the bathroom all the time. And it takes up to one year before somebody says, you know, something is wrong. Let's look at it. When we talk about um, treatment, the treatment really is surgery for majority of the time followed by additional treatment with chemotherapy. Um, Surgery, they're quite extensive operation. If somebody says they can do ovarian cancer surgery in two and a half, three years, I would say it's powerful, but it really takes five, six hours to do the surgery. 
these are long surgeries, extensive surgeries include bowel resections, include resection of bladder, maybe ureters, maybe diaphragm. Um, once you go in there, it's really, you have to remove all cancer that you can see. It's very, very common to do bowel resections. It's very common to do diaphragmatic resection. We remove lymph glands if it's involved by tumor. Um, these are very, very extensive operations. This is not uncommon that once you go inside, you will find tumor spots all over. And, and it really takes about a good five, six, seven hours of work to remove all the tumor. This is tumor implants. Uh, this is liver retracted. You can see tumor spots on the diaphragm. This is very common. If you leave this tumor behind, it's almost impossible to cure. It doesn't matter how much chemotherapy you give. So when we talk about uh, evaluation, it's important uh, that surgery be performed by gynecologic oncologists who are trained in uh, women's cancer. Uh, not by OBGYN doctors or general surgeons. They do need addi additional training. And there's overwhelming data that um, if surgery is done by gynecologic oncology or specialized, you have much higher cure rates. Goal from surgery is to remove all cancer that you can see. All cancer that you can see. This is a research that came back in 1994 that if you leave any tumor behind, it decreases your survival rate. Doesn't matter how much chemotherapy it gives. So the, sorry. And this is also, if you leave tumor behind, the goal is to remove all visible tumor. But if you leave any tumor behind, um, you do have the risk of not being able to cure the disease. Um, in this, the top line shows the tumor, there was no visible tumor. And those patients had the longest survival. They had the longest survival. However, uh, if you leave any tumor behind, and the survival goes down dramatically. So surgery plays a very, very big role in this um, um, cure. This was, again, study done that if you are able to remove all the cancer, you have much higher survival rate. Um, I'm switching gears again. What after surgery? Most of the patient, I would say almost everyone after surgery will need some sort of chemotherapy treatment. I put together this slide going back 1978. We have come a long way for ovarian cancer, and we have a very standardized treatment. Most of these drugs are not currently in use except paclitaxel. Most of the patients do need chemotherapy treatment um, after um, surgery. Um, this was a study done um, at Roswell Park and national level, and this is the chemotherapy that is administered directly in the abdomen after surgery. Traditional treatment involves giving intravenous chemotherapy treatment, but this data showed this is the first time in history of cancer, doesn't matter any cancer, that giving chemotherapy directly in the abdomen after operation improved 16-month survival. Nothing has ever, ever shown this dramatic improvement. Um, so there are a few places this offer this treatment, giving chemotherapy directly in the abdomen. At Good Samaritan Hospital, we do offer this treatment. It is, it is very uh, tedious. But... If you can administer this chemotherapy treatment, this is the best, hands on the best way of administering chemotherapy. So, concluding, um, it's really important to have family history. Based on that, you could have early detection. It's very, very important to select your surgeon and type of chemotherapy treatment, and nothing like having a support system. I have two more slides. This is what I feel about ovarian cancer, but it doesn't mean we can't win. And this slide is from Andrea Martinez. And she always talked about be strong when you're weak, be brave when you're scared, be humble when you're victorious, be badass every day. So I, this is her statement, and I still carry it with me. And I thank you for having me here. Um, I would invite questions uh, if any from the audience or. Yes. Sigal, thank you very much. That was great. Um, you mentioned Lynch syndrome and you mentioned uh, genetic links. No. Thank you. You mentioned Lynch syndrome and you mentioned uh, possible genetic links between uh, ovarian cancer and other diseases. Um, is there a role for prophylactic? Uh, oophorectomies, prophylactic removal of the ovaries in patients with those diagnoses? You know, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, so I will change the term from prophylactic to risk reduction. Um, prophylactic, um, 
still, it is good, but we like risk reduction. So the question is, if someone has genetic mutation, BRCA mutation, Lynch uh, mutation, um, can you decrease the risk of ovarian cancer? So we have very good idea as to someone with BRCA mutation one and two, when they will develop in time frame ovarian cancer. If you are able to remove ovaries and fallopian tube before they develop cancer, you will decrease the risk of ovarian cancer by about 95%. And the reason I say 95% because the inside lining of abdomen, which covers the inside lining called peritoneum, and the ovaries are derived from a single cell, so the inside lining of abdomen is still at risk of developing cancer, which behaves just like ovarian cancer. So that risk is about 5% over lifetime. So anyone who's diagnosed with BRCA mutation or Lynch mutation, um, once they have completed childbearing, it's open. Childbearing could be 25, 28, 30, 35. But anytime more than 35, you start to notice risk of ovarian cancer goes up. So we like to recommend removing ovaries and follow up in tube before of not sooner than 35, but after they have completed childbearing. And that is the only way to decrease risk of ovarian cancer. I have other, I will go even further, more and more research is coming out. I have several patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer at age 35, 38. It's not normal to develop breast cancer at young age. But they are negative for BRCA mutation. They are negative for all this testing. That doesn't mean they may not have element of genetic mutation that's not been diagnosed yet. Our technology is still primitive. We are every single day finding out new and new mutations that may account for developing uh, development of breast cancer at early age. So be mindful, having a negative genetic mutation testing doesn't mean that you do not keep an eye on news media, uh, do not keep an eye on new technology every six months, every year, the new things keeps coming up that you may benefit from. Thank you for your presentation, that was helpful. Um, so we know that peritoneal cancers and um, ovarian cancers can sometimes be difficult to differentiate. Uh, so I wanted to know, are there any, as far as screening is concerned, are there any tumor markers um, for peritoneal cancers? Or are there any treatments that have been tried for these types of cancers as well? Does it overlap with ovarian cancer? Right. So that's an excellent question. The question is um, the inside lining of abdom abdomen called peritoneum and ovarian cancer. Both cancers behave exactly the same. And I can tell you men, they never, ever, ever develop peritoneal cancer. It's only in women. So we believe that both ovarian cancer and peritoneal cancer behave the same. The distinction is under microscope, once you perform the tumor surgery, under microscope, if tumor is invading into ovary about four millimeter, we call it ovarian cancer. If it doesn't, we call it peritoneal cancer. So this distinction is mostly for um, academic and teaching purposes. For clinical treatment, the goals are exactly the same. So fallopian tube cancer, peritoneal cancer, and ovarian cancer, they behave exactly the same. Uh, there's very minor distinction under microscope, but for treatment purposes, for surgery and chemotherapy treatment, it's exactly the same. I hope that answered your question. Maybe not. The blood test, the tumor marker, we still use the same, what called CA125 level. That was developed at Roswell Park, where I was trained. We still use CA125 level. That is very sensitive. Uh, patients who have cancer, we use that marker blood test every chemotherapy treatment to see how they're responding to treatment. But CA125 level is not a um, screening test. We just did surgery last week um, at Good Samaritan Hospital. Patient had CA125 level of 2,800. The normal range is zero to 35. 2,800 is, is very, very high. And I was fully concerned she has cancer, but it was not cancer. She has endometriosis that was ruptured and spreading throughout the belly. There was no cancer. So it's not a marker that you can test who has cancer, who doesn't have cancer. But once someone has cancer, you can use that blood test to tailor and see how they're responding to treatment. Sure. Thank you very much. If anyone still has questions uh, for the doctor, you'll notice on your table there are some comment cards. So you can leave a question there, just leave the writing face up, 
and uh, during the next break, we'll come and collect those, and we'll make sure that your questions get answered. I would now like to turn the stage over to our next speaker, Christine Brennan. Christine is the Program Director of Cancer and Careers, an organization that empowers and educates people with cancer to thrive in the workplace. Christine. Great. Um, so as uh, I was, as you introduced me, I'm Chrissy Brennan. I'm the Director of Programs at Cancer and Careers. I'm really pleased to be with all of you this morning to talk a little bit about balancing work and cancer. For those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, I just want to tell you briefly about it. We are a 17-year-old national nonprofit that empowers and educates people with cancer to thrive in their work environment. Um, and we do that by uh, offering a comprehensive website in both English and Spanish. We have a host of publications also, both in English and Spanish. We offer career coaching. We have webinars throughout the year that are archived, live webinars, and they're archived on our um, on our website. And we offer our programs and services to patients, survivors, healthcare professionals, and employers. Mm -hmm. And all of our services are offered free of charge. So uh, I've set these slides up in a bit of a story arc to give some structure about what I'm going to talk uh, to you about this morning. And I imagine that those of you who are patients are all in different places in terms of your own story and the things you're thinking about. Some of you may have just been diagnosed. Some of you uh, may have already made decisions about whether to work through treatment. And others perhaps are thinking about going back to work after ha having taken some time off. Um, but regardless of where you are today, I hope that you will find some pieces of what I discussed that are useful now and perhaps others that you can tuck away for later uh, because there's a lot of information um, you know, that applies a, along the arc for each individual path that you, each of you is on. Um, and I want to begin by acknowledging the challenges and the tensions that arise when thinking about uh, your work, your life, how everything is going to come together. Um, and specifically when we think about that, the intersection of work and cancer, um, it's important to recognize that a lot of questions come up. And sometimes the answers to those questions are naturally in conflict with one another. Um, and in the midst of all these, this asking and answering, there are really two overarching questions that can help to begin to illuminate the best path forward for you. And the first question is, how important is work to you personally? And what really does that mean? And then the second, what information do you need in order to make the best possible decision for yourself about working through treatment? And inevitably, this is going to lead to a lot more questions, um, because as we know, what we want isn't always what's feasible. Um, and so the key question then becomes, how do you find a path that's workable for you? So some additional points to consider. Um, how will your treatment and your schedule affect your work, and vice versa? Um, certainly, thank you, certainly um, talking with your healthcare team about uh, what, you know, Talking with your healthcare team about that subject is going to be important. Finding out things such as uh, when, you know, depending on the protocol you're on for treatment, when your side effects are likely to kick in. Um, if, for example, you're on a chemotherapy that makes you feel unwell almost immediately, is it possible for you to schedule your treatment on a Friday so that you have the weekend to recover at home? Um, well, I realize there may not always be flexibility and availability in terms of appointments. Um, you know, I encourage you to be proactive and talk to your healthcare provider about what works for you. It's also important to talk to your medical team about other parts of your work, such as your commute. Um, you know, for example, is it going to be feasible for you to sit in rush hour traffic for 60 minutes twice a day to and from work? Um, you know, or if you travel to work via public transportation, is your immune system going to be able to manage you know, being on a bus or a subway during cold and flu season? And of course, no person is only their diagnosis and their work. So what are other aspects of your life that you are going to want to have energy for? You know, perhaps you've taken a new class, or you're the one who cooks all the meals at home, or you're responsible for transporting your kids to and from sports practice. 
Um, you know, the truth is that each of us has a limited pool of resources and energy that gets divvied up into our own personal pie chart. And so you add cancer to the mix and that pie gets smaller and smaller as treatment continues and prioritizing is going to become really important. And clearly finances and insurance are usually tied to our jobs and are also very important. Um, so often those become the driving factors in determining whether or not you're gonna work through treatment. Or maybe they're important, but they're not the number one reason. Um, you know, many people want to continue working um, because first and foremost, it's who they are. It's, it's what they do. Um, and you know, I think particularly in this country, when we meet someone for the first time and we say, what do you do? You know, we don't say, what's your favorite food? Or, um, you know, what's the best book you've read? Uh, so it really becomes a very profound question. And for people who all of a sudden are realizing that they may no longer be able to work in the same way they used to, then there becomes, for some, an, a secondary crisis, which is an identity crisis. So you want to think about how you are going to respond to that um, emotionally. And you want to talk to your healthcare team about it so that they know where you're coming from. Um, especially if it looks like your capacity to work is going to be impacted. So in an effort to answer all these questions and make some decisions, um, you're going to need to do a lot of information gathering. And this slide is great because it shows you, you know, the different buckets, so to speak, uh, where that information can be sorted. And so we just talked a lot about the medical and treatment, or not a lot, but we talked a little bit about the medical and treatment information. But I want to make another uh, point, which is you want to be um, very specific regarding the type of work you do. You know, it's not going to be enough to tell your doctor and uh, medical team, uh, I'm an account executive. You know, you want to share with them what your responsibilities are day to day, what your routine looks like. And the next uh, bucket is work information. So for that, you're going to want to consult your employee handbook or information, you know, papers that you might have signed when you first took your job um, to find out what's available to you in terms of health care or health insurance, mm -hmm. I should say. But also, are there workplace policies such as flexible schedules or donated leave pools that you might have access to? And then the third category, legal information. Um, I am not an attorney. So uh, while I'm going to talk about the law, I'm going to do so only in very broad uh, terms. But I strongly encourage any of you who has a legal question to consult an attorney, a cancer rights attorney, an employment attorney, about, the, you know, about your specific circumstances. I've also listed some legal resources at the end of this presentation. Um, but the law plays a very important role in thinking about and talking about work and cancer, which is why I include it. But I also want to emphasize that the, the point of talking about it is not because, um, you know, it, I think it's likely that an employment situation will become litigious, but rally, rather it's because legal and practical issues don't uh, exist in separate vacuums. You know, often when there's a practical concern, there's a legal piece to it as well. Um, and for many, the law becomes a very valuable tool in helping them to create a plan for working through treatment. So for the purposes of today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, I'll give you a bit of background so that you know it's something you should explore further based on your own situation. Like all laws, um, well, I, first I should say the ADA is a federal law, so that means it applies in all 50 states. Um, like all laws, it has certain requirements that must be met in order for you to use it. And in broad strokes, those requirements are that your employer must have a minimum of 15 employees, you must have the necessary skills, certifications, et cetera, to do the job you are hired to do, and your disability must meet the criteria determined by the ADA. Um, if you meet all of these requirements, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act can pr protect you from discrimination. Um, it can also provide access to reasonable accommodations, which I will touch on a little later. Again, I really just want you all to leave here to, you know, leave here knowing that the law is uh, one of the many tools you can use to figure out how to balance work and cancer. But I also encourage you to speak with a professional if you have concerns about your specific situation. So now I want to talk just briefly about the online space. 
Um, we hear from survivors all the time about the role that the internet is playing in helping them through their cancer experience. For many people, it creates a sense of community. Uh, some people blog to kind of make sense about everything that they're going through, which can really help them um, feel better in the moment. But it also creates a written record of information that can be difficult to get rid of. At the same time, research indicates that more and more employers and hiring managers are Googling employees and prospective candidates. And they're not necessarily doing it to find something negative. Rather, they're, they're doing it to find out more about the people they work with or um, about uh, someone they're thinking of hiring. Um, still, it's possible that they'll come across information that that individual would prefer not to share with the, an employer. So I want to be clear, I'm not saying never post um, anything. I just think it's very important for people how to, to have a better understanding of the virtual landscape um, so that they can make informed decisions about how their story is being presented online. And while I imagine that there are a few of you who are, you know, are saying to yourself, but, but I'm always really careful, I, I check my privacy settings and so forth, um, you know, doesn't that mean that you know, it's secure? But the fact is that the answer is a little more complicated than that because websites and social media platforms gather users' information all the time for various reasons and they change their uh, privacy policies pretty frequently. Um, so it's important to be aware of that. Unfortunately, I don't have time to take a deep dive into online privacy, but uh, what I will say is um, we have a webinar uh, that we just did that's archived on our website on disclosure and privacy, and we also have a document on our website about maintaining privacy, which you may find useful. So if privacy policies provide imperfect protection, um, what are other steps you can take? And we recommend uh, developing a personal disclosure plan. To start, you want to make clear decisions about what, if any, information you're going to share uh, about your cancer journey, who you're going to share it with, where you're going to share it um, in terms of specific websites and blogs and so forth. Um, and as you think through what's best for you in terms of disclosure, you want to consider the potential long-term impact of disclosing online. You know, it may be the case that um, some of you have disclosed at work and everyone there is really supportive. Uh, and that's, a, that's an amazing situation to be in. But the fact is that the internet isn't going away. And so what happens if you find yourself looking for a job in a few years, or that amazingly supportive boss you have now moves on and you have a new hiring, or a new manager, I should say, who's starting to Google her staff to find out more about them? Um, you know, there's no way to know how that person is gonna respond to information that they read or that they find. And then once you've decided whether to disclose and to whom, um, be sure to communicate those decisions with the people who are close to you, your family, your friends, your loved ones, those connect, with whom you're connected intimately online. Um, we've heard stories from a number of survivors who were inadvertently outed in terms of their health status by a very well-intended loved one. Um, so it's something you want to be aware of. And even if you have shared your preferences um, to those close to you, it's also a good idea to kind of check out what other people are posting. Uh, so just so you have a sense of what's out there online. And you also may want to consider your relationship to the larger cancer community. You know, perhaps you volunteer with a cancer organization um, and you want to include that information or share that information, uh, but not the fact that you yourself are a survivor. And that's fine. It's just a matter of being careful about you know, the language that you choose. Um, so then we want to think about you know, what can you do to take control of what shows up about you in a Google search. And the fact is there's a lot that you can do. Um, but really the main thing is to be thoughtful and strategic about what you post. Um, you know, if you think about it, people don't know what you don't share with them. Um, and in a work context, uh, social media is a forum where you can not only, you know, tell people but actually show them what you do as a professional, who you are. So social media sites such as LinkedIn and um, Instagram and the others you see listed here rank very high in Google searches. So becoming active on these sites and presenting a voice that represents who you are as a professional is going to be an excellent way to help elevate your brand. That said, you want to keep in mind, of course, that different platforms have different audiences. So you might, you know, talk about a great recipe you tried um, 
on you know, your Facebook page, but that's not going to be really appropriate for LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where you want to maybe uh, you know, comment on the latest trend in your industry or you want to post that you have a new certification. Um, so it's just kind of keeping, uh, keeping in mind who the audience is on the different social media platform you are uh, posting on. And when building an online brand, as I said, you know, you want to think strategically. And one of the things we recommend is to run your posts through a filter of sorts um, by asking yourself questions such as, would I want my boss to know this? Would I want this on my, uh, you know, hometown newspaper? Or would I want my mother to see this? You also want to keep in mind that while you can delete posts that are no longer relevant um, for you personally, uh, they may likely still exist somewhere out there. They're just going to be a little bit harder to find. So when it comes to disclosing at work, like all decisions around um, sharing news, it's, that really is an incredibly personal decision and one that requires a lot of thought. Uh, but just so that we are all on the same page, you are not required to provide information about your health or your health history to your employer, a current employer or prospective employer, at any point in time, nor are they allowed to ask about it. Um, that said, there can be situations where you might have to share information in order to access your rights under the law. But this doesn't mean you need to share every last detail about your diagnosis or your prognosis. It just means that you have to provide some support for um, indicating why you're eligible for whatever it is you're asking for. For example, it would be very difficult for someone to credibly file a complaint against their employer for discrimination under the ADA if their employer had no idea they had a condition that they might discriminate against. So all this to say, it's important to consider all the angles. You know, when someone asks me, should I disclose, um, I like to tell them, you can always say more later, but you can never say less. Um, mm -hmm. If there's a need for you to divulge more information down the road, you can be prepared to do that. But you don't need to share everything right away. So as you determine whether to share information about your cancer status at work, there are two major things to consider overall. First of all, how will treatment interfere with your ability to do your job, to perform your, the essential functions of your job? And what legal benefits are there to sharing this information? So it's important to note that people want to share for various reasons. Um, you know, some, it comes down to personal communication style. Some of us are sharers, period. Um, and we couldn't imagine going through a life-changing event such as a cancer diagnosis and not telling people about it. Others are much more private and, in fact, very uncomfortable sharing personal information. Um, so really, it's about knowing yourself uh, and realizing that however you feel about sharing or not sharing is valid and should be taken into consideration. The culture of your workplace might also play a role in determining whether or not to share information. You know, do you work at a small company where it's really like a second family and everyone comes in on Monday and talks about their weekends and their kids and their vacations and so forth? Or are you at a larger, more corporate environment where it's a little competitive and it's very siloed and people are very kind of hunkered down, focused on, on getting the job done? The bottom line is that you want to think about the various ways people communicate at work um, you know, with each other and how much you want to share if you want to share at all. It's also worth considering um, whether anyone in your workplace has gone through something similar. And it doesn't need to be cancer. You know, perhaps someone is out on maternity leave or someone is um, taking time off to care for an aging parent. You know, what has, your, what has the employer provided for them, if anything, in terms of uh, solutions or, you know, trying to meet their needs? Um, and how has the rest of the team reacted? You know, have people, like, stepped up and pitched in and really wanted to help that employee? Or has there kind of been some grumbling kind of behind the scenes about having to take on added responsibilities? So it can be helpful to consider these situations as you make a determination about whether or not to share. It also can be really smart to consider past performances. You know, let's say you have been at a company for five years and you've always gotten a stellar evaluation. But now you 
are starting to learn that you're feeling run down, you're feeling fatigued, uh, and that's likely to continue for a while. You may want to consider sharing information with your employer, um, just so there's no gaps in understanding if you are no longer meeting the same marks. Um, you know, if suddenly you're not able to do the job at the same level, um, and there's no context around it, your employer may just chalk that up to a decline in performance. And if that gets into your evaluation and your personal file, you know, that can have a lasting impact. We also get asked a lot um, at Cancer and Careers, you know, who should I tell if I'm gonna share my information at work? Um, and we recommend starting with whomever you're the most comfortable with. Um, you know, whoever you uh, have, you know, are comfortable speaking with on a regular basis. And for many people, that's their supervisor because they tend to have an ongoing dialogue with them. Um, and a supervisor can also be an advocate for the employee with higher ups. For other people, their supervisor is not an option, um, which I completely understand, uh, in which case they may want to go speak with someone in human resources if the company has a human resources department. Um, but per perhaps the most important thing uh, to convey if you're gonna have this conversation is that your situation is gonna be fluid and it's gonna change over time. Um, and the information that you are providing with your, to your employer now um, you know, may not apply two weeks from now or two months from now or two years from now. And so that it's gonna be an ongoing dialogue that, and you really hope that you can continue the, the conversation. I also, uh, you would also wanna give some thought to um, the reality of your physical self in the workplace. Uh, you know, how you personally are going to handle the side effects that you're likely to experience, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of your treatment and how, how that's gonna impact your job. And again, this is where you're gonna wanna talk to your medical team um, to understand what side effects you are likely to experience so that you can feel as comfortable and as productive as possible if you've decided to work through treatment. It's also going to be important to think about any poten potential visible physical side effects uh, that you're likely to experience, especially if you've chosen not to disclose your information. Because if your colleagues start to notice that you are losing weight or gaining weight or losing your hair or feeling really run down and are just not your usual self, um, they may start to ask some questions. Uh, and, and generally those questions come from a place of uh, you know, concern and kindness. Still, it can create a, an awkward situation where you might end up um, inadvertently disclosing something that you hadn't intended on sharing. So it's worth it to spend some time thinking about you know, the possible answers to questions that may come up. Now, a lot of people ask about chemo brain uh, and brain fog, very common side effect. Um, and unfortunately, there's no magic bullet to help combat it. Um, but in thinking about some helpful strategies, our first piece of advice is always to let go of the idea of multitasking. You know, research shows that only 2% of people multitask effectively. And while we may all think we're in that 2%, it's worth kind of spending some time thinking about that. Um, and getting back to basics, you know, writing down a list of priorities, turning off your phone, your email notifications so there are no distractions, um, you know, and focusing on one thing at a time. Writing everything down is a really good practice. It creates a written record for you to refer to. Um, and we also suggest keeping a single notebook with all of your to-dos in it and taking that with you wherever you go. Also taking time to rehearse things, presentations, um, you know, progress reports, even phone calls, that can also be very useful. So your disclosure decisions um, are gonna drive some of the strategy around how you communicate at work. However, uh, whether or not you choose to disclose widely, creating a dialogue in the office um, that supports your goal is gonna be key. And one strategy is to identify a point person someone you trust who's willing to be a centralized source of information about you, your health, your schedule. That's gonna uh, prevent you from having to update so many people on a regular basis um, on how you're feeling and, and so forth. And that uh, point person can also be your go-to um, so that you can find out what's going on at work when you are not in the office. You're also going to want to understand what your uh, priorities are, um, you know, and what your deliverables are, and what your team's expecting of you, and how you're going to deliver it. 
And while this final point about you know, setting limits can be really challenging, it is critical that you be honest with yourself in terms of what your capacity is. Um, and then you set uh, realistic boundaries and you stick to them. And what often helps in those situations are um, you know, rehearsing what we call professional no's, uh, which I've included a few examples. So another workplace strategy is to use reasonable accommodations, which, as I mentioned earlier, are one of the benefits of the Americans with Disabilities Act, if you qualify. And basically, they are tools uh, that can be used to help people work through treatment or return to work after treatment to, to make that process manageable. Um, having examples uh, can make it easier to envision how accommodations might work. Um, and I've listed some on the next slide, but I just want to note that there's a lot of information about the ADA, um, you know, what reasonable accommodations are, how to use them, how they're useful for both you and your employer um, on these resources listed here as well as the ada.gov website. So here are some questions to help identify possible work accommodations. And while I don't have time to run through each of them, I do want to highlight uh, one or two. For instance, having access to a flexible schedule can be a very useful accommodation. One that allows you to work the same number of hours each day, but, but adjust the start and end times of the day so that you are maximizing the time when you feel your best and strongest. Uh, another you know, uh, flexibility would be to be able to take time out during your day for appointments and so forth and make up the time later in the day or later in the week. Another example is working remotely, you know, um, something that could uh, eliminate a draining commute if that's going to be a problem for you. So obviously not all of these are going to apply for every type of job. It's definitely not a one-size-fits-all, um, but they're meant to get you thinking about reasonable accommodations and what might work for you in your particular situation. So job searching, while, uh, you know, when you're returning to work or if you're changing careers, um, you know, and you're still managing your, your cancer diagnosis or recovery, that is a whole topic in and to itself. Um, but I did just want to take a moment to discuss the issue of disclosure um, as it relates to the job search, because it's a real concern for a lot of people whom we speak with. A lot of people ask us whether they should include their diagnosis in a cover letter or a resume when they're job hunting, um, either as an explanation or you know, a, a positive, having gone through something positive. And you know, my first response is always, you need to do what feels comfortable and authentic for you. But I would caution you to think about this. The goal of a cover letter and a resume um, are to get you an interview based on your skills um, and your potential. So in that sense, your cancer history, your diagnosis and treatment aren't really part of the conversation. Um, another important point to consider is that if you share that information in a letter, um, it's not going to be a dynamic exchange. And by that, I mean you're not going to be physically sitting there when that information is absorbed, so you won't be able to answer any questions or offer additional context. The bottom line really is no one shares everything about themselves in a job interview or for, you know, for that matter, once they're hired. So I just advise people to be, um, you know, to communicate appropriately for where they are in the process. If you feel it's critically important for you to let your employer know about your um, health status before you accept, accept a job offer, um, we just recommend that you wait perhaps until a little further along in the hiring process so that everyone involved in the hiring has had a chance to get to know you, get to know you as a person and as a potential employee. Um, you know, rather than them just reading that information and then possibly putting your application into the no pile. So here are some uh, job search resources in particular. We have a resume review service at Cancer and Careers, uh, a job search toolkit. I have some copies of that on the table out there. And then some upcoming webinars that Cancer and Careers has that you may be interested in. Uh, again, they're free. You just go to our website and register. And I also just wanted to flag for next year, our annual national conference on working cancer is a full day event in New York City. It's free. Um, and then you can order publications off our website. And then finally, some additional resources uh, you know, about 
legal resources and workplace issues. Um, triage Cancer listed at the top is a content partner of ours. Um, they have a lot of terrific information on their website. And then finally, my contact information. Um, I know we're running a little short on time, so I'm happy to um, take questions now or you know, feel free to reach out if you have questions. Uh, I'll be here for the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions now, if anyone has any questions now in particular. Just waving. <laughs> um, if you're BRCA positive and you have health insurance and you switch to another health insurance company, is there a problem with that? Is um, can pre-existing condition and all that? Is it as a pre-existing yeah. condition? It shouldn't be given our current health insurance. Um, but I. It really depends on the health insurance that you have, the new policy that you're going to. I hesitate to give you know, information about health insurance in particular and the law because it's, it's super specific. Um, so currently, pre-existing conditions are not an issue, but you know, we have elections coming up. Um, it's hard to know how, how things might change. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Again, I, I would also, um, you know, you can consult some of the resources, as I said, health-related health and legal resources on our website. That might be a better way to go. Sorry, I couldn't be more specific. Anyone else? All right, thank you again for your time. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Barry Douglas with the Long Island Plastic Surgical Group. It is with pleasure that I'm here to introduce a patient of mine, Ms. Carol Nardi. Whereas most breast cancers are diagnosed through routine screening mammograms or palpable lump that requires additional workup, Carol's journey began very differently. In October of 2016, Carol was involved in a car accident. As a result of a significant amount of impact, an airbag deployed. And as a result of significant enough trauma to the chest, further workup was required. And a certain shadow was discovered in soft tissue. Could it be a hematoma? Yes, possibly. But it did require additional workup. And in fact, workup required biopsy, which in fact showed a cancer. So actually, Carol's journey began as a airbag that deployed. And perhaps this was serendipity with what started out as an unfortunate car accident. A cancer was detected almost certainly considerably earlier than had it been left to insidiously get larger and possibly spread had this event not occurred. It is therefore with great pleasure that I would like to introduce Carol Nardi, who will give a very inspirational, emotional and heartfelt discussion of her journey. And I recommend tissues to be within arm's reach. <laughs> Carol? Thank you, Dr. Douglas. That was very nice. And good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Dr. Douglas and Lisa Mounier for inviting me to speak today. When Lisa called me in late July, I was very flattered. However, very shortly, reality and panic set in. I am not a public speaker. I would like to share my story with everyone but I would do it only because Dr. Douglas did so much for me over the past 18 months. I could never say no. So here I stand, hoping not to disappoint. I'd also like to acknowledge my family and my very close friends who were with me through it all. Always at my side, always at the ready, for any task, big or small. 
Even my husband, after 47 years, did his first load of laundry. I'm going to move along quickly because I only have 10 minutes to tell you something that took place over the past two years. My story began, as Dr. Douglas said, on October 10th of 2016. I was in Pennsylvania with my two best friends on a shopping trip. We were involved in a motor vehicle accident with total airbag deployment. I, being the driver, was hit in the chest and, of course, developed chest pain. I had a CAT scan, which was negative for fracture, but did detect small soft tissue swelling in my right breast, and they recommended follow-up. I was always diligent with my yearly mammographies, but I was beginning to entertain the idea of perhaps at age 69, with no personal or family history of breast cancer, maybe having one every two years. Nevertheless, I saw my physician, and I had my mammography on November 22nd at the same facility that I had used for many years. I wasn't overly concerned because previous exams had always detected irregularities, things like scattered fibroglandular densities, uh, underlying vague nodularity, and always, they said, no suspicious masses, no evidence of malignancy. So I felt fairly certain that this would be the same. Never in the past, of all the exams I had, did anyone ever suggest a sonogram for confirmation. And so I felt I was okay. But this mammography turned out to be quite different. They immediately did a sonogram of both breasts because they saw something in the left as well. And it all culminated in biopsies of multiple sites on December 1st. Three days later, on December 4th, I received a phone call from the physician who did the biopsies. In my heart, I'm thinking, it's going to be negative. But the voice on the phone was saying, I'm sorry, it's not. It's positive. I was numb. My mind was racing. This can't be right. This can't be me. I have breast cancer. The words that were so hard to hear but even harder to say as I lowered that boom on my husband. We sat in silent disbelief. Dr. Virginia Morrow was my very next phone call the next morning. A friend and colleague from some 30 years ago, there was nobody I trusted more. Her very competent staff directed me to get all the copies and reports of mammography, sonograms, CAT scans, and pathology slides. All had to be in her office before my first visit. I saw Dr. Mora on December 14th and again heard the dreaded words, you have breast cancer. She was honest and optimistic. We discussed my options, lumpectomy with radiation or total mastectomy. I chose the latter. I already knew what I wanted to do. I had played it over and over in my mind. I wanted everything out. I didn't want to deal with what ifs, and I didn't want radiation. So my choice was clear, total mastectomy. Dr. Mora had me schedule an MRI, and she sent the slides on to California for additional testing. <coughs> Excuse me. She had, her plan was for me to see a plastic surgeon and eventually an oncologist. It's now 10 days before Christmas. I could not share this news with anybody until after the holiday. I couldn't bear the thought of my children feeling the pain and ruining the holiday for everyone, especially my grandchildren. So my husband and I agreed this would wait until December 26th. There was still work to be done, an MRI on December 20th and a few more doctor's appointments. Surprisingly, the MRI picked up two more sites never detected on mammography or sonogram. My biggest fear was that I would not be able to tell my kids without crying. And so I prayed. I prayed every day, every minute, that my mind was idle. 
I prayed that God would give me the strength to get through what was ahead of me, and of course not to cry when telling my kids. Then I thought of my oldest grandchild, Madison, now 17 and healthy, who at the tender age of nine was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia. And her biggest fear at nine years old was losing her hair, which she did not once but twice. This was my defining moment. I knew I could do this. Now I come to the turning point in the whole story. It is December 22nd, and I have my first appointment with Dr. Douglas. Dr. Douglas, you once told me that my energy and my spirit played a role in my successful recovery. Well, you were right, and you instilled that spirit in me that very first day. You managed to ease my apprehension and allay many of my fears. Your calming demeanor, your sincerity, and your compassion were key. You lifted my spirits that very first day. And even though there were four of us in that room that day, my husband, you, I, and Terry, you made me feel like it was just you and I. Your patience and understanding were astounding, and I felt comfortable and confident being in your care. You explained my options, and you drew great pictures. <laughs> and I saved them. Just for the record, Dr. Douglas, picture day was never my favorite. <laughs> Just imagine you're standing in front of the green screen, arms outstretched, everything that's imperfect about you is on display, and those bat wings are just swaying in the breeze. <laughs> Thanks for always making it a surprise. I made my decision, tram flap reconstruction, a tummy tuck being an added bonus. Everything from here comes up here. And uh, I never imagined that all that belly fat that I was carrying around all these years would actually come in handy, but it did. <laughs> I'm also totally amazed at the power of prayer. I managed to tell my story to my family and my friends without once crying or losing control of my emotions. Uh, on January 17th, I had my pre-op surgery at Winthrop. The usual blood work, EKG, medical surgical history exam. But then they started taking measurements of my wrists, my hands, my arms. Basic numbers, baseline numbers in the event of node involvement and lymphedema. My heart sank. My surgery was Wednesday morning, January 25th exactly one month after Christmas and one month before my 70th birthday. I was calm. The staff were great. They were all friendly and kind. And I was lying in the pre-op area, saw Dr. Mora, Dr. Douglas, and anesthesia. And then another physician came in to place sentinel node markers. My heart sank again, and I couldn't wait for them to put me to sleep. Some seven and a half hours later, I awoke in recovery, feeling nauseous but not in any pain. My hospitalization was uneventful. Two days later, I was discharged home, a couple of drains hanging around uh, that required daily emptying and tallying, but all in all, it was good. I was able to manage my pain, but I tired easily and I slept a lot. Over the course of the next few weeks, I saw Dr. Douglas twice a week. Terry had explained to me in one of my initial visits that postoperatively, Dr. Douglas would manage my care, I would become his patient, and no longer Dr. Morris. The office staff at LIPS were wonderful. The girls were so accommodating. They scheduled all my appointments, they, and they were always smiling. And at that point, I needed that because I felt like I had just crawled out from under a rock. I also need to recognize Terry, Dr. Douglas's nurse. She was a big part of my recovery. Always upbeat, always uplifting, supportive and encouraging. Thank you, Terry. You always made me feel so comfortable at every visit, even on picture day. 
On February 17th, I had my first oncology appointment. No node involvement, very early stage one. No chemo. All the tumors were hormone receptor positive. They were all fed by estrogen and progesterone. Treatment would be anti-estrogen therapy, which consisted of one pill a day for five years. I could certainly handle that. So how did this all come to be? How could I have been so fortunate? How might things have been different if I hadn't had that car accident? Would it have delayed my mammography for another year? Would I have thus changed the outcome of everything? And so even though I told my husband's car that day, we feel that it was a blessing in disguise, an accidental finding. On July 6th, Dr. Douglas discharged me, and I thought about nipple reconstruction. I thought about it, and I researched it, and I thought, why? Who's going to see this? It took me a good year to realize that I was only going to do this for me and nobody else. So I was going to see it. So on March 21st of this year, in a snowstorm, I had nipple reconstruction by Dr. Douglas at Winthrop's outpatient surgery facility. Another decision I'm happy to have made and so pleased with the results. On May 29th, I was again discharged by Dr. Douglas, a very sad day. I felt like I was losing two good friends, Dr. Douglas and Terry. You were there for me throughout. My rock when I doubted, my inspiration when I faltered, and my support through it all. You got me through some very gray and gloomy days. I continue to see Dr. Mora every six months, sonogram every six months, MRI every 18. I also see Dr. Hindenburg, my oncologist, every six months. And blood work is always a prerequisite for each visit so he can monitor the effects of the anti-estrogen therapy. Bone density is done every two years. I've made some changes in my life. I've, uh, pos has, that have, has, have had a positive effect on me physically and mentally. Healthier food choices, I do cheat. Daily exercise, I'm up to three miles a day at the high school track. Takes me an hour to walk three miles. <laughs> And the only person I can pass is a little old lady with a walker. <laughs> but that's OK. It's my hour, and I love it. It gives me time to think, to plan, and time to construct this speech, which I think took me about 120 miles. <laughs> Dr. Moore and Dr. Douglas, it is because of you that I stand here today, whole and complete, and able to share my story with a feel-good ending. I hold you in the highest regard and with the utmost admiration. Dr. Douglas, you gave me back everything I lost. You restored my dignity. You, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Your talent and artistry are a gift. And that you share that gift with others makes it the greatest gift of all. I never imagined when I started this journey that the outcome would be so amazing. A true testament to your skill and expertise. Thank you hardly seems adequate, but it's all I have. Should our paths never cross again, I will never forget you. You will always have a place in my heart. Thank you. Breast reconstruction is an option available to all women diagnosed with breast cancer, and there are many types of reconstruction options. Breast reconstruction is about more than physical appearance. Many women who have had reconstruction can speak to the fact that it made them feel whole again, which carries tremendous benefits for both mental and emotional health, just as we heard Carol speak about earlier. At this time, I'd like to call to the podium Dr. Michael Dobransky, 
Dr. Dobransky will be moderating a panel discussion with his peers on innovations in breast reconstruction. Dr. Dobransky is a partner at Long Island Plastic Surgical Group. He obtained his medical degree and general surgery residency at NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Dobransky then went into the prestigious Cleveland Clinic where he completed a plastic surgery residency and a postgraduate fellowship in aesthetic surgery. He is certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Doctor, thank you. Thank you everyone and for coming and thank you again, Kristen, for hosting. Excuse me. I will, in the interest of time, skip the introduction of my esteemed colleagues because I will probably take thir the full 30 minutes that we're allotted to just introduce their credentials. Uh, but it is available in the brochure that you guys will have. Dr. Douglas, I'm going to start with you. Um, lately, a lot of press has been given to something called ALCL, Bre Breast Implant Associated ALCL. Could you tell us about what it means and what are the symptoms and, if anything, what is there to be done about it? This, this is an, enti <clears throat> an entity. It's an anaplastic large cell lymphoma that appears to be causally linked to biofilms that develop around textured, not so much smooth, but textured implants. It is a rare occurrence with statistics of approximately one in 30,000 instances. Uh, there have been in the world approximately 570 cases that have been documented and there's ways of determining how this presents and how to document it. Would you like specifics, uh, Michael? Yes, please. So how does this present? This rare entity presents anywhere from one to eight, but 20 years, usually about eight years after an augmentation or breast reconstruction with a textured implant where the patient will have a unilateral sudden swelling, which usually is a seroma. Now this could be a totally innocent seroma, but if this occurs, it has to be worked up, where under sonographic guidance, there would be needle aspiration of the fluid, which would be sent for certain immunochemical studies, uh, flow cytometry, cytology, et cetera, to determine whether in fact there are cells that are identifiable as this anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Thank you. What about uh, the treatments for the implants themselves? Is there an indication for removal? So if there is a documentation of ALCL, it is usually, in most cases, just fixed to the biofilm and the capsule, which is immediately around the implant. The treatment in almost all cases is an open capsulectomy, meaning that you are removing the implant, obviously, and the entire mesothelial capsule with the involvement. Now, in certain rare cases, there has been lymph node involvement and even metastases. Uh, worldwide, there have actually been 16 recorded deaths that have been linked to this, but it is still a very, very, very rare occurrence. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. I'll, I would like to also maybe add, if you don't mind, that the deaths that have been linked with this have all been late diagnoses, where diagnosis was delayed for more than a year of symptoms and uh, they have all been systemic involvements and the patients have not received the appropriate recommended therapy. So it, it, this is a treatable disease. Yes, it can be a fatal disease, but this is a treatable disease. I think one more thing to add that's important is that people that have these implants, there is no need to panic and the, the recommendation is not that everyone that has a textured implant have it removed. It is only if a seroma, a unilateral symptomatology develops where further workup is required. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Dr. Kilgo, um, what is new in implant-based reconstruction? So there have been several developments um, in both technique and technology that when combined have allowed us to uh, create a more natural looking and uh, feeling reconstructed breasts. The, the long-standing criticism of implant breast reconstruction is that the breasts simply just look like implants. And with the widespread acceptance of skin sparing mastectomies and the, and the increasing popularity of nipple sparing procedures, you know, it's become incumbent upon us as plastic surgeons to really 
fill out the skin envelope that the breast surgeon leaves behind to, to restore the, the natural breast shape. So uh, I'll start out by talking about fat grafting, which is something we've talked about on this panel before, but it's really revolutionized breast implant reconstruction in my opinion. It's a simple procedure where we're taking fat from one part of the body, purifying it, injecting it into the reconstructed breasts in areas where you might have a contour regularity or a thin, a, a thin area. Um, and that serves to improve the shape of the breast and also to thicken the flap so that the, the reconstruction is more uh, living tissue than implant, or has more living tissue um, uh, than, uh, um, as well as an implant. But it, it, it lessens our, uh, the dependence on the reconstruction on the shape of the implant to create the eventual shape of the breast. Um, so in speaking about implants, that's, that's the next subject. Um, there have been significant increases in implant technology. Um, and we have more implants available to us today to choose from than we ever have had in the past. And I'm particularly fond of the newer, uh, highly cohesive gels. Some people call them gummy bear implants um, that, are, that are slightly filled to a higher capacity than, than they have been in the past. And those go a long way in addressing the issues we had with what's called visibility, wrinkling, rippling. These implants are more cohesive, but they're very, still very soft, and they're much less likely to uh, to ripple and wrinkle, um, which was a real problem with saline implants in the past. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is something called acellular dermal matrices, which are basically, it's a, it's a skin replacement of biological origin. It's usually human derived, can be come from a cow or, or a pig. Um, they're sterilized and they're, they're put in the reconstructed breast to provide additional structure and support. And historically, we have used them to wrap the lower portion of the implant while the upper portion of the implant is covered with the pectoralis major muscle. But, you know, and the newest development, and I think a very exciting development in implant reconstruction is we're now putting the implant, in some cases, above the muscle and wrapping the entire prosthesis in the, in, in the ADM, which allows us to really maximize our ability to fill that natural skin envelope. Again, going back to the natural, natural techniques. Um, so in summary, you know, we've had these developments coupled with, I think, better aesthetic mastectomies um, that have allow, allowed us to evolve from creating a breast that looks like an implant to creating a breast that actually looks like a natural breast. Thank you. So uh, in continuing this discussion, the, there was an article in the New York Times approximately three weeks ago that actually talked about uh, the prepectoral breast reconstruction. Uh, can you delve into, uh, into this a little deeper for us and tell us who the candidates are and how that's, that decision is made? Right. So, so the big advantage of that procedure, and it is sort of the hot topic today in plastic surgery, is it, it all stems from minimizing our manipulation of the pectoralis major muscle. So, so the two big impacts, I think, are that it, it, it decreases postoperative pain. We're not cutting the muscle. We're not elevating the muscle. And that hopefully will trans laid into decreased use of narcotic pain medication, quicker re recovery times, you know, shorter hospital stays, and potentially, you know, this is a new procedure so we don't have a lot of long-term data, but potentially that might translate into decreased chronic pain. And the other thing, it's, it's, it's very good at addressing something called um, the animation deformity, which is a very common problem with women who've had implant reconstructions, and it's a, it's a dysfunctional relationship between the muscle and the implant. When the muscle contracts, the implant shifts up and outwards so the entire reconstructed breast does as well, and the skin over it wrinkles and ripples, and it's a very unnatural look, and it can be quite distressing, but that procedure is um, very effective in eliminating that problem. So in terms of candidates, just to, to, to um, elaborate a little bit, um, it's probably better to talk about who's not a candidate for it, and patients who may have an issue with wound healing problems, um, you know, the reason we put the implant over the, the muscle over the implant traditionally was to protect the implant from wound healing issues, infection, infection of the implant, and, and reconstructive failure. So patients who have very thin mastectomy flaps that, that don't have a good blood supply, uh, poorly controlled diabetics, smokers, patients who have been radiated would probably better serve with a more traditional technique. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Dr. Natoli, uh, would you please give us the latest updates on breast reconstruction uh, flap planning and design, free flap planning and design? Yeah, so to talk a little bit about autologous reconstruction, which is basically when we use a patient's own tissue to reconstruct the breast, 
There's, there's nothing, I would say, this year per, per se that's revolutionary. However, we're getting better at the techniques that we use and the planning in general. Um, it's very common to use a CAT scan ahead of these procedures to map out where we take the blood vessels from. So um, the most common type of autologous reconstruction that we use as breast surgeons is from the tummy, uh, deep inferior epigastric perforator flap which is kind of the evolution of what used to be called a tram flap when we would take the uh, patient's muscle as well. And kind of like what Dr. Kilgo was saying, the downside of using the muscle was it really weakened uh, on, on different levels, but it, it put the ma uh, muscle in an unnatural position and caused patients to have a lot of abdominal and core weakness as a result of the surgery. So with time, as microsurgery has developed, we've been better at dissecting into the belly and preserving the muscle and just taking the blood vessel with the overlying tissue, the fat of the tummy, and the overlying skin. And as our technology and radiology techniques have improved, we've been able to really target the um, better blood vessels. So even though with a standard deep flap, we're using the same blood vessel, the anatomical variations between patients vary. And what we've learned as we've continued to study and prove on what we do is that depending on where we get those perforators, whether they're from more of the central part of the abdomen or the lateral part of the abdomen, we could see a higher rate in abdominal hernias and bulges after when we're taking them laterally. However, those uh, perforators tend to give a patient a more robust blood supply. So things that have um, kind of plagued uh, perhaps the re reconstructive patient after having a little fat that didn't do well, that didn't have a good blood supply, and it can present as like a little cystic lesion or even as a mass in a patient that had previously had breast cancer is always distressful. So as we do these preoperative scans to really improve and target upon the blood vessels we're using, we're able to really select uh, for um, better perfusion. Um, and even though I would still say that the mainstay of our autologous reconstruction is, tends to be from the tummy, that's the, the um, main donor site that we use, there's many alternatives. Tug flaps are from the inner thigh. Um, S-gap and I-gap flaps are different acronyms for using the buttock fat. There is newer alternatives as well that have, uh, that have come up in the last couple of years. A pap flap is from the posterior thigh in someone that doesn't have enough tissue from their belly as well. Um, and this has been a nice alternative to using the buttock tissue because if, if someone were to grab their buttock and then grab their tummy, the tummy fat is a lot softer and it feels a lot more like a supple soft breast than the buttock does, which tends to be a little firmer because we're sitting on it all the time. So the posterior thigh flap has been a nice alternative. And in terms of sur surgical procedure, we're able to do that with the posi patient positioned on their back, so it uh, decreases operative time as well. Thank you. Uh, what about pain? What about post-operative pain? Uh, are there any developments in terms of pain management for these patients? Yeah. So I would say we're looking at, you know, really ways to improve what we do, even though it may be the same procedure. Um, and a nice targeted approach has been working with the anesthesiologist using targeted blocks. So a transverse abdominis a plane block is a, or called a tap block is basically a procedure that can be done with ultrasound guidance, um, injecting a long-acting anesthetic at the time of the surgery. So often when we're harvesting the abdominal muscle, we're able to basically d deposit a long-acting um, anesthetic into the plane where the muscle is harvested from and where that dissection really takes place to decrease the amount of time the patient spends in the hospital. So with these deep reconstructions, if we put it, um, the ones that have been put on protocol and study have shown that, especially with the obese patient, because their, their pain scores have tended to be higher, um, that their length of stay in the hospital is almost a day shorter using these blocks um, as a standard fashion. And we've really been able, especially with the narcotic epidemic in the country, to decrease the amount of narcotics these patients are taking postoperatively. And, you know, a lot of these patients are young patients that are doing bilateral uh, prophylactic surgeries that are going home to kids, and we certainly don't want to give them another problem, narcotic, you know, dependency after, which is a, re a real problem in, in these big surgeries. Thank you. Um, one of the previous speakers mentioned uh, lymphedema, being measured for lymphedema, actually. Uh, could you maybe elaborate on uh, the updates in terms of the role of microsurgery in treating lymphedema, should that happen? Sure. 
So lymphedema is a problem that you know we have, and, and less so today with less ag aggressive and more targeted uh, axillary node dissections, but, but still a problem for patients when they have it. We are good at um, helping to alleviate the, the symptoms of lymphedema and helping to improve it. However, we certainly there's no cure for it at this point. So in terms of new techniques and, and improving techniques in microsurgery, what, um, there's really two mainstays. One is lean, um, sorry, lymphovenous bypass uh, procedures, and the other is vascularized lymph node transfer. And these have been used for years. However, um, with more of the use of lymphocentigraphy um, and using the endocyanine dye to kind of target the um, um, lymphatic system, we're able to, with the lymphovenous bypass, to really um, map out the lymphatics ahead of time. And basically what we're looking for is very, very tiny uh, lymphatics under the surface to attach them to basically venules, little veins under the surface. Um, and it's, they call it super microsurgery because the um, lumens are less than a millimeter in, in size, so it's, it's done under the microscope. And by targeting specifically where we know these lymphatics are uh, more robust, we're able to divert some more of that interstitial, that lymphatic fluid that accumulates in the upper extremities. And it can happen in the lower extremity too, but specifically with axillary dissections happens in the upper extremity. So that's one technique. Um, that's better for patients with stage one and stage two lymphedema. In the more severe patients, sometimes that's coupled or um, in a patient that needs a breast reconstruction that's having a delayed reconstruction, then to actually transfer uh, vascularized lymph nodes at the same time as transferring the belly tissue with the deep procedure, we're able to target those lymphatics, uh, the lymph nodes in the groin and literally bring them and um, bring new lymphatics to the axilla and improve the lymphedema that way. So the techniques, you know, we're refining them certainly with these improvements in microsurgery um, and seeing real results, although a cure is, you know, at, at this time still eluded us. Thank you. Um, I'll open the floor to questions for the panel. Yes. and do the transplant at the time of the deep flap? Absolutely, and that's what we try to achieve when we can. So in patients, if, if you guys didn't hear at the beginning of the question, in patients who are seeking to have a deep flap or a tram flap, do you do the lymph node transfers at the same time? So that's, that's the best indication for it in patients that are having a delayed reconstruction. Or in patients of mine, I've also done it for patients that have had an implant reconstruction and ended up needing radiation and had problems and developed lymphedema, and we go to try to, um, you know, basically alter their reconstruction by giving them autolog autologous reconstruction. We plan and map out doing the lymphatic procedure at the same time that we do the deep reconstruction or tissue transfer. And, and some people do have it just on, you know, Patients who are satisfied or don't want a breast reconstruction but are really plagued by the lymphedema and that's really affecting their quality of life, they have these, you know, vascularized lymph node transfers alone for treatment that can be successful as well. Thank you. I just want to add a comment. Um, I think we all touched upon very different topics in breast reconstruction and, and what's going on today. However, so much of what we do and what we all do is, is overlapped. So in microsurgery, when we're treating patients, I have patients all the time that I use fat grafting for or patients that sometimes you know, also need implants. Uh, and so there's a lot of overlap between these different techniques and they really work well in conjunction. Um, I do myself a lot of secondary breast reconstruction and revisions in patients that maybe had a reconstruction 10 years ago and are looking for, they're just not happy with their result and they tend to be very hesitant to come in and, and, and complain about it because they're just happy that, you know, they're alive and they're a survivor. However, there's a lot that we can offer with these newer techniques that Dr. Kilgo spoke about. So, you know, a patient that every time she wears a low-cut dress, her breast is jumping up, we can change those pockets and those are things that are still covered by insurance and adding a little fat to an area that, you know, has chronically bothered a patient for years and years and it's, it's really never too late. 
Thank you, panel. At this time, I'd like to introduce Jerry Barish. Jerry has been at the forefront of the battle against breast cancer on Long Island since 1988 and has earned the distinction of being New York State's preeminent breast cancer activist. As president of One in Nine, Jerry has spearheaded negotiations of the New York State's pesticide registry law, which created an accessible database to determine whether there is a relationship between pesticide use and breast cancer. Jerry. So today, I am extremely excited to be here, to be here because to talk about 20 years ago, the opening of Hewlett House. I found a speech that I had written on October 22, 1998, and um, I'd like to read it to you because it's very apropos, especially of what we as women, um, not to offend any gentlemen here, um, have accomplished what we do and then I'll bring you up to date a little bit on this incredible journey that I myself have been through. October 23rd, 1998. Over two centuries ago, the Hewlett family built this incredible house where we stand today. As I think about that era, I think of the women who were dressed as I am today, which was the period of time, and who it is safe to say did much of the work of making this homestead a happy and successful place. Whether they were churning the milk to make butter, making the family clothes, or raising the children, then like now, the roles of caretaker, nurturer, homemaker, and laborer were invariably filled by them. Life wasn't always easy. It was a struggle to balance all these tasks, to fulfill so many responsibilities. Naturally, the women of the 18th century were successful susceptible to ill health and disease, and some no doubt were unknowingly, unknowingly victims of breast cancer, which has existed in some form for centuries. Today, notwithstanding the enormous gains women have made socially and economically, we still tend to fill the multiple roles our ancestors did. And despite the amazing developments in science and medicine that have marked the industrial age, we have seen, particularly in the past 20 years or so, breast cancer become an epidemic that is ravaging women around the world, particularly in our Long Island community. And as you know, I've been fortunate enough to survive this disease. Others have not been so lucky. As a survivor, I believe I have no choice to engage in a struggle, a struggle not only to continue surviving, but to learn new skills and fulfill new roles as an advocate, an organizer, an agitator, and an educator. Together with all of my colleagues, with the extraordinary commitment of our community of supporters in business and politics, with our friends and neighbors, we have used these skills raising money and awareness, fighting for a cure, and looking for the causes wherever it may lead of breast cancer. We leave no stone unturned, we make no compromises, we take no prisoners because we are on a mission. And now with our partners in the Nassau County Legislature, we have a new weapon in our arsenal, Hewlett House, the first free-to-all comprehensive breast cancer education and resource center in the nation. 12 months a year, seven days a week, we will be here to address the concerns of breast cancer survivors and patients, their families and friends, whether it is counseling, information, or therapy, or yoga, or simply a place to relax and have a cup of coffee. Hewlett House will be their home away from home. And it is this environment that we will take our struggle to the next level, which of course is victory. So imbued with the spirit of our forebearers today, we dedicate this wonderful place, this house of hope, this memorial to life, to those who have died and those who have survived, but most importantly, to those generations who are not yet with us, but who we are determined to keep free from this disease. Ultimately, I envision Hewlett House as a museum, a treatment, a testament to struggle, a testament to commitment, but no longer needed as a weapon in the battle because victory will be ours. Well, victory is not there yet. We still have a long way to go. I'm a five-time cancer survivor, and Hewlett House has truly been there for me. Each time I was diagnosed, I jumped in my car and ran back to that house knowing all of the survivors who run the programs, 
the doctor who's on board with us, the patients, are there to give me a hug and support. Because even though I'm the executive director and run it, I still have my emotions and my fears like everyone else. The incredible thing about this home, and some of you I know have been there, the wig program, the bras, the prosthetics, the counseling, the support groups, just hanging out, the gardens, the art center. I could go on and on and on and on, but this is about hope and love and hugs. From the pet therapy programs to watching somebody come in and say, where do I go? I have no place to go. Will you have a home? And that's what it's about. To all the doctors in the hospitals that we work with that come into our doors, to my own doctors at South Nassau who keep me going, I have to tell you, we have the best right here in Long Island. To the Long Island Plastics, who I have to say, made my husband a new man, God bless you. Um, we are, and that's from his cheek and his ear, so no ideas. But we certainly have the very best here. We have incredible places to go. I invite you to come and see what we do. To see those knitters in there and crocheters making those, those little animals to give out to the children. Because now we do all cancer. And when you see them come in, and when you see groups of men and women that whether they have cancer on their head, on their toe, it doesn't matter because we're all in this fight together. Um, I can't thank you enough for allowing me, uh, Lisa and Janine, to talk about Hewlett House, our 20th anniversary. We have seen just under 29,000 people that we have serviced, all at no charge. So, if you haven't been there, Come and see us. Come and visit. It's quite a place. I'm very, very proud. Thank you. We actually want to bring Jerry back up. We have a special announcement and a special visitor with us here. Senator Todd Kaminsky is here today and has a special honor for Jerry. Jerry, where'd you go? No. Did she leave? No, Jerry. Anyone here on behalf of Jerry? Anyone? Oh, good. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Senator, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. I don't know. She, I don't know how that... Oh, oh well. Anyway. Okay. So I'm uh, fortunate enough to represent Jerry, and uh, I, th I think uh, Jerry and I have had this conversation privately, and I'll share it with her again, but certainly... Um, so many people's lives have been made better because Jerry is, is in their lives. And on the 20th anniversary of Hewlett House, we just thought it was so important to recognize the great work she does, does so many different things for people in a, in a very difficult time, and she's just been a tremendous asset to the community. Uh, so I just wanted to let her know that the, the Senate appreciates her, the people of the state of New York appreciates her, and the official state record of New York will now reflect on the 20th anniversary of Hewlett House, how important she is, and it states that uh, Jerry Bowers is the lifeblood of our community. Her work so often goes unrecognized and unheralded, but we officially recognize Jerry Bowers as an individual worthy of her highest respect and esteem. Keep up the good work. I'll just quickly say on behalf of Jerry Bowers, who is an incredible woman, the Hewlett House is also incredible. What a nice place for people to gather. Please go see it, um, and I will definitely deliver this to her. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have our guest of honor and keynote speaker, Dee Dee Ricks. Dee Dee Ricks is an entrepreneur, public health advocate, and expert on patient navigation. D.D. was living the dream as a high-powered hedge fund consultant with two children until breast cancer changed her world. Ricks underwent a double mastectomy and chemotherapy to treat her aggressive cancer, followed by breast reconstruction surgery. Ms. Ricks' story was shared with the world in the HBO documentary, The Education of D.D. Ricks. 
The documentary followed Dee Dee in her journey from diagnosis to survivorship and the many challenges and hardships she endured along the way, including learning about low health literacy in underserved communities, becoming deeply passionate to end injustice in healthcare accessibility, and the drive to make patient navigation a household name. Dee Dee views health as a human right and has committed her life to make people aware of the healthcare resources to which they are entitled. She often says that cancer is the worst and the best thing that ever happened to her. Please join me in welcoming Dee Dee Ricks. Good afternoon. I um, want to start off by saying it's okay to hate that woman in the beginning. I know I do. Every time I see that trailer, I cringe. Um, but uh, that's why we're here today, is to really hear how I went from that spoiled, awful brat um, to the ever-evolving survivor that I am today. Um, today's discussion is really based upon the art of survival. So I basically put together um, my favorite quotes in terms of all the keys that go into what I call creating this masterpiece of surviving. Uh, I found this one quote, and once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure, in fact, whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain. When you come out of that storm, you won't be the same person that walked in. I've learned that surviving is not innate, that it's actually a learned art. Uh, there's many moments that I've gone through in my life, and uh, my history has been somewhat interesting from the standpoint of it's not been the normal. Um, that most people experience when they're growing up. I left home at six, um, moved in with my aunt, uncles, and then uh, eventually at 13, moved in with my best friend, started working full-time at Chick-fil-A, uh, and then had this dream that I wanted to go to college. And I had my sights set on University of Florida. It was University of Florida or nothing. And I got in, uh, barely and uh, spent four years there. And it was the first time I ever felt like I had a home. Um, despite the hard work and the academics, uh, you know, it was really a place where I found myself. Um, I graduated from University of Florida and moved to New York City without knowing a soul. Um, I still to this day think, why did I do that? Uh, but three years into it, um, I started my own hedge fund consulting company at the ripe old age of 24. Over the past 26 years, I've had incredibly good fortune. Um, I am probably one of the luckiest women alive on many fronts. But even through all of my success and even some of my hardships, nothing could have possibly prepared me for what was about to come. So let's fast forward. I've left University of Florida. I've come up to New York. I have this great business. It's 2007. I'm running a multi-million dollar business in the hedge fund industry. Um, I have two beautiful baby boys um, that were two and a half and six. I was a single mom and I thought I had everything. And then I heard these words, you have cancer and the left breast must come off immediately. Like anyone that hears this diagnosis, I was you know, stunned. So I'm thinking, what do I do? My sons are babies. So I started filming moments with them, 
such as reading the book, I'll Love You Forever, going to the park with them, having dinner with them, anything, so they would have these moments if I were to die. And then one day, my life changed forever. I now know that if you're lucky enough, you're going to have this quote-unquote aha moment. And I found this quote, um, a moment's insight is sometimes worth a lifetime or life's experiences. And that statement could not be further from the truth as it pertains to my history. A week after my double mastectomy, I walk into the Ralph Lauren Cancer Center in Harlem and I meet Dr. Harold P. Freeman. And he says these words to me, poverty should not be an offense that is punishable by death. Now, I went to University of Florida, I'm thinking, whoa, what is that again? Um, you're going to have to repeat that for me. So, you know, we, we went over it and we discussed what it really meant, you know, poverty should not be an offense that is punishable by death. My life changed that day because when you're diagnosed with this deadly disease, you begin to reevaluate your life. I hadn't yet moved the needle in helping others, nor did I believe that I had yet created a legacy that would have left my sons proud of me if I were to die. I was still that spoiled brat. And I knew that it was no longer about just me and my sons. I had the power to go out there and affect other lives. Dr. Freeman taught me that, and it was my responsibility to go out there and be the role model and help others to see that there's 100 million Americans in our country that are dying and don't have access to health care. This brings me to my next key of a masterpiece, which is giving. Survival is a privilege which entails obligations. I am forever asking myself what I can do for those who have not survived. So, you know, I'm you know, going through all of this. Um, you know, I began my chemotherapy. That moment that I met Dr. Freeman, um, very much in my usual DD way, I'm like, I'm going to raise you two and a half million dollars in our first meeting. And it, it, he's shocked. He's like, what do you mean? Uh, and I made this commitment to him. And I'm in the process of chemotherapy. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm doing all of this to give back and to help others. I'm trying to raise my kids. And I'm trying also to run my business to help others. My physician said, don't do this. You need to focus on your health. You have to be there for your boys. But something, and I don't know if it was my past when I was a little girl, you just keep going. And I realized that I didn't want to be that self-centered person anymore. So my focus became working with women who were underinsured or uninsured and helping them get access to treatment. Uh, the next one, vulnerability. Never be ashamed of a scar. It simply means you were stronger than when it ever tried to hurt you. The documentary was a very difficult decision for me to make. It exposed um, some of the most intimate moments of my journey. You see the scene where I say goodbye to my breast. You see the next scene where I look at myself in the mirror after my breast had been cut off. Keeps going, watch my process with reconstruction and what I go through, my chemotherapy, and my son's reaction to my disease. HBO shocked me. I saw the film for the first time, and I'm sitting there, and there was this moment where I, I'm so proud. I, my hair was all straggly, and so I shaved it off. And so I go in, and I pull my wig off, and I have a clean shaven head, and I'm thinking I'm doing this great thing. I walk out of the room, they catch on camera, and they say to my oldest son, what did you think? And he shook his head, and he's like, no, it was awful. So you don't realize sometimes, you know, when you're caught up in the moment, what these little kids are thinking in their minds, and I'm going through, and I'm seeing everything that I expose my children to. You talk about vulnerability and being raw and exposing yourself, but there is a reason that I chose to do this. I knew that my life could be an example for others, 
and that my vulnerability in showing what you're going to go through could be an example that you can get through this and that it's okay for your children to see you suffer. Education. Once you stop learning, you start dying. So many people have asked me about the documentary in terms of what was the purpose of it. If you, if you watch the documentary, it's a story about me as a white successful woman and what I go through fighting cancer versus Cynthia who was African American and uninsured. It's a story about two different women from two different backgrounds who become dear friends. You see, Cynthia was young, vivacious, just like me. The only difference between the two of us is that I was white and rich, and she was poor and black. There was no other difference between us. So we follow her treatment, and then tragically, her death. When I met Cynthia, I did not believe that this is the way the story was going to end. You know, she was so incredible. Cynthia wasn't given her constitutional right to live. This happens way too often in this country now when you were stage four or underinsured. I knew, and I made her a promise, that this was going to change and that we were going to go out there and fight for women that had what she had and that didn't have access and that couldn't get the medical treatment that they needed. So how was I going to do this? And we talk about the education. My education came from Dr. Freeman. He discovered years ago that treating the underserved community wasn't actually an issue of making sure they got the medicine, although that's a part of it. The larger obstacle went to actually making sure that they could overcome barriers. Well, what does that mean? It means maybe they can't get to treatment because they can't afford the subway to get there. They can't afford gas. They can't afford babysitting services for their kids. Who's going to take care of their kids? So they skip treatment. Maybe they can't even speak the language and communicate to their doctor how they're feeling. All of these barriers, they became known as in overcoming these barriers and having timely access to care became known as patient navigation. Patient navigation stresses timely access. Cynthia was diagnosed three years after she discovered her lump. No one wanted to treat her because she was uninsured. Determination. It's not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. I think that when you think about determination, uh, I realize that my life has been um, very fortunate. Um, I often look at what we've done and I realize that my life is, and my destiny is saving lives, very much like mine has been saved. You know, many people say, hey, you, this is all you focus on. And, you know, don't you ever get tired of it? And I do. Come on, we've all had those moments where you just don't want to get out of bed. So I do the stupid things like recollect quotes from Gandhi, be the change that you want to see in this world. That helps me to get my bed or, you know, my butt out of bed and do at least one thing that day, which contributes to giving back to saving a life or helping those most in need. Strength. You never know how strong you are until your choice, your, until being strong is your only choice. This photo um, is a very poignant photo for me. It was the first time as a cancer patient um, and three weeks into my chemotherapy that um, I ever did a public speaking engagement. We were in LA, and we all know how vain and much everyone uh, focuses on your looks there. And you saw me with my long blonde Paris 
Hilton wig. I like if I have to have a wig on, I'm gonna really go for something that I would never wear and, and look like in my normal life. So I'm walking out on stage, and everyone's like, "Oh God, here comes another bimbo." I knew, and I never ever taken my wig off in public, but I knew that if I didn't take my wig off, there's no way anyone would have listened to me. There was over 2,000 people in that crowd that night. So. This is my first moment. You could have heard a pin drop that night. I realized that despite being a single woman and in my past being completely consumed with what I look like, that my destiny now was to use my illness and my um, physical appearance to help others cope. So, Right now, um, I want to, because I know that you guys have been sitting for a long day, I, I just want to do this one little exercise. If you have had a moment in your life where you have been giving back, it could be volunteering, it could be um, starting a foundation, whatever it might be, um, and you realized, whether it be that night or two months down, two years down, that what you were doing actually helped you more than the people that you were helping. If you've had that moment, just stand up. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's, um, it's a very, go ahead, you guys can sit down. I'm very impressed that you see so many. This, the process that I've been through and all of the um, keys that we've gone over, um, strengths, um, determination, aha moments, that all happened really during the period of the documentary. And that was what I would like to call phase one of the education of Dee Dee Ricks. And most people think, okay, it's done, it's over with, you've told your story, enough lady. We're moving on to stage two of my life. And what everything that I went through was about to prepare me for the biggest battle of my life. So, you know, you talk about thankfulness and the importance of appreciating where you are. There's one thing that I've honed in with my sons is never, ever take for granted what you have. We are very fortunate, and it is your job and your obligation to pay it forward. My sons are incredible in that they are very generous, very loving, they are very accepting. But I really didn't understand the um, severity of how much that they were affected from the documentary. So you see these photos up here of um, kids in hockey uh, uniforms. My sons are avid hockey players. And I'm watching my older son play uh, his first game where he's allowed to hit. And so he's allowed to check. He plays defense. So I watch him send a kid over the boards, and I'm thinking, where did this violence come from? That's my gentle giant, not my baby. And then all the negative thoughts started coming in. I've screwed up my kids. I, I've, I've exposed them to too much. He's feeling the effects of everything that we've gone through. I never really thought what they went through as children. I dragged them to Congress to testify. I put them on Good Morning America. I mean, they were just exposed to the world as much as I was. And it was starting to dawn on me that maybe this wasn't a good thing for them. And I always wondered, did they remember Cynthia? And this is an aha moment. I sit in the car with him. It's so hard to even tell the story. And I said, John, John, what happened there? I've never seen that side of you. He goes, Mom, they called LJ the N-word. I lost it because I knew then and there that my sons cared about social justice. My kids, I was a good example for my boys. And then from then on, everyone knows there's no diversity in hockey. And I knew that what I needed to do was to give back in their world and something that they understood. So we started the Next Gen AAA Foundation. And what we do is we go out there and very talented kids that cannot afford to play the sport. It's $15,000 a year, and that's cheap. But there are some kids out there that could really go to the next level. So we 
created this foundation. Four years later, I'm proud to say that we've raised over 800, and when I say we, I mean me and my boys. They have not missed an event. They've been to every practice. They are in there with all of these kids. We have 264 student athletes now, part of our program, boys and girls, um, from all different types of backgrounds. Um, we have given away this year alone $183,000 in scholarship. We were able to get $164,000 of scholarships, you know, awarded to from the schools, and we're changing these kids' lives and we're giving them a better life. I asked you earlier to stand up if something you have done has made your life better. Love. There is a land of the living and then the land of the dead, and the bridge is love, the only survival, the only meaning. You're going to notice in these photos that there's three boys. Well, welcome and meet my third son, Dante. Dante was a part of NextGen in the very beginning. I don't know how it happened. If in the beginning, it was two nights staying over, and then three nights, and then four nights, and then, well, what are you doing this weekend? Well, we're doing X. Well, can I go? Ultimately, you know, over the four-year period, um, I, financially, I've taken Dante on. I'm spending $60,000 a year to send him to one of the top prep schools in the country. He has a 97 GPA. Uh, he got a 96 on the PSAT. He's slated to go to Colgate University on a D1 commitment. I'm very, very proud of my work with Dante, but I am even more happy that I've been able to get this kid and my sons have another brother and that they don't see color. We've really bonded as a family and I, I, this Christmas, it's one of the funniest stories. Dante comes in, my kids are with their um, father, we're divorced, and it's just he and I. And it's Christmas Eve, and I'm like, let's watch It's a Wonderful Life. And he's like, no, let's watch Tyler Perry's Christmas Media. <laughs> and, 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 and he's like, hashtag, oh, no, she didn't. And I'm like, wait a minute, okay, all right, so let's settle. You know, we're going to compromise here. Um, let's watch National Lapoon's Christmas Vacation. He goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, you haven't ever seen Chevy Chase and the movies and Vacation? So we ended up watching it, and then afterwards, I mean, the whole time he's just shaking his head. And I'm like, well, what did you think? He goes, Didi, that Clark, he is a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, um, Dante has really filled our lives, and I'll explain a little bit more about filling our lives in just a second. Forgiveness. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. You see two photos here. I think um, I talked earlier about my quote unquote unusual childhood. Um, the first photo is my mother and I. Um, I finally went to go see her. Um, she's riddled with Alzheimer's. Um, we clearly did not have a relationship. I never really had that mother in my life. Unfortunately, I realized too late that you know everything that I've gone through, I knew that I, something still wasn't right with me. And I knew that I had to let go of this anger and this resentment. And so you know, I went to visit my mom, and it was too late. She didn't, she didn't get it. But I think that you know, for me, it was, it was a healthy exercise um, however, my father, who's below, um, is crazy as coot, um, but he is um, my dad. And we have rekindled our relationship, and this is a photo taken in April at his 80th birthday party. I bring this up about forgiveness because I know in order to truly heal and really have that ever-evolving survivor, you need to get rid of the anger inside or the hurt. And then as I started to think positively about my parents, I realized something. I actually had great parents. And you're probably thinking, what do you mean they left you? Well, 
I am who I am today, and I am as strong as I am today because my parents weren't there to say no. I don't know no. I don't know what it's like for someone to say, oh, don't go ride your bike, you might get hurt. So in some ways, I owe my parents a great deal because they gave me the, the basis to be whom I am today. Fearlessness. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And um, the better part of Franklin D. Roosevelt was his wife. You gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You see munificent asset management here. And um, I, I'm, I'm sharing this with you today, and I'll try to make this story short uh, as we try to wind down here. But um, I decided in 2015 that I was going to compete and try to build my own hedge fund. After all, I've done it for every other billionaire out there. I've built some of the best hedge funds in the world, so I'm like, I can do this for myself. So I went out and I started my own hedge fund, and three months into it, I was diagnosed with cancer again. This time it was stage three melanoma. So right as I'm going through one of the hardest things I've ever done, I was clearly out of my league. This was something I had never done, but I, I knew that I never wanted to be that girl that said, I should have, or I, I wish I would have taken that chance. And I can look myself in the mirror every day and say, you did it, but you failed. But let's talk about failure. I might not have raised a billion dollars, but Munificent became a seeding fund for healthcare technologies. My first investment, which I funded personally, my first investment returned seven times, my second 30 times my initial investment, and I'm currently spending about 70% of my time now working on a technology that was developed by NASA. And uh, it's a technology that does two things. First and foremost is disease detection. We're working with Johns Hopkins University, and we're, we're doing a, a uh, a trial where you can breathe into d the technology and it detects the biomarkers and it can detect stage one lung cancer. Everyone knows that if you detect lung cancer, it's almost 99% curable if found at stage zero or one. Now, all of a sudden, this company that I started is now, I'm able to use the technology and my background to be able to give back and to save lives. You heard me mention the toughest battle of my life earlier. The other technology that we're, the technology that we're using this for is also in addition to disease detection for drug detection. So we are able to, um, marijuana, opioids, uh, Xanax, so on and so forth. I bring this up because um, my son suffered three concussions from hockey, and we went through a lot as a family, but he turned to marijuana, and he turned to Xanax. In six months, I watched my baby boy completely fall apart. I'll never forget the night that I got the call, and I went to the hospital, he had overdosed. And I, I'm looking, and he's got this empty stare to him, and I'm thinking, I don't know how I'm going to get my kid back. I'm proud to say that the next day, my son checked himself into rehab. This was in September of last year. He's worked really, really hard to come back. I am so, so, I, I can't even believe I'm telling this because it was just such a nightmare. He's in an outpatient program. He's been clean and sober now for almost eight months. He's got a straight A average now this year in school, and we're finally seeing the light of day with everything that he went through. So, you know, you talk about saving lives, and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm watching my own child go through the most horrific experience of his life, and now I'm working on this technology that has the ability to detect the um, uh, 
consummation of, of horrible drugs such as Xanax and opioids. And you realize what's happening in our country today. And while most people in the hedge fund industry would say that I failed, I didn't. I was able to turn my career into something where yet again I'm doing what I do best, which is saving and helping lives, including my own sons. Carpe diem. In the end of the day, we only regret the chances we didn't take. And I always listen to this song the first time I was ever diagnosed. And he said someday, I hope you get the chance to live like you are dying. You know, this past year, I haven't been able to think outside of my sons. Um, you know, I've been all consumed with making sure that all of us got on the right path. And I turned 50 in April, and I was supposed to go to India, and I made the choice not to go because I couldn't leave my kids. Two weeks ago, my girlfriend called me, and things are, things are good, knock on wood. And she's like, Daddy's having his 90th birthday next week. Come. So in two days, I got my visa, I packed up, and I got on the plane, and I'm like, how did that all happen? And I realized as a survivor, we have to take those moments, and we have to go out there and carpe diem and seize the day. India was a life-changing experience for me. Not only did I see how impoverished the company was, um, I was also exposed to the seven wonders of the world, the Taj Mahal. But on the last day, I went to um, Temple with Nima. And you go through, and they're like, we have to cover your head. I'm like, OK, no problem. And then you need to be barefoot. Now, all of you are like, OK, what's the big deal about being barefoot? When I was diagnosed with melanoma, um, it was my toe. And we amputated my toe. And I had this thing that I was just so insecure about the way my foot looked. I could have both of my breasts cut off, show the whole entire world, but I'm so embarrassed to show my four toes. And I'm sitting in temple, there, the praying's going on, the banging of this, I think it was the most insane experience of crying because I realized yet again I've made it out on the other side. And I'm thanking God, and then I look down and I look at my foot. And for the first time ever, I wasn't thinking, oh my God, I, I look deformed. It was, oh my God, I'm so lucky. So carpe diem is a very important part about creating this masterpiece and creating this beautiful life and realizing that you can live your life after going through traumatic experiences. Remember. No matter how far you go in life, never forget where you came from. Um, this is a photo of my Aunt Peggy. Uh, Aunt Peg really helped to raise me. I grew up in Tennessee at one point, and um, uh, she was very integral at a certain point in my life. Well, Aunt Peg was also uh, diagnosed with cancer in 1994, and she had a mastectomy, and she was prescribed six chemo treatments, and she just did three. In her typical um, Texas and Tennessee way, she looks at me and she goes, I'm done. No, no one's touching me, and that's the end of that. So I go to see her um, when I went to go see my mom, because they were in the same area. And Aunt Peg also has Alzheimer's. And I'm so depressed, because I'm looking at my mom, and I'm thinking, this is, this is my future. Alzheimer's just destroys you. And then I'm going to go see my Aunt Peg, who also has it. And I just remember Aunt Peg as being this vivacious, this incredibly funny, outgoing woman. And I walk in, and I'm expecting to see a woman like my mom. And she doesn't recognize me, but that's OK. And I watch her interacting, and they're playing a game. And the game is, you know, 
find ways to say goodbye to each other. Let's recall ways to say goodbye. I mean, the residents are going, adios, um, you know, see you later, this, that, and the other. And my Aunt Peg is so bored. And finally she just says, how about get the hell out? <laughs> but it hit me that Alzheimer's didn't change her. She was still that fun, loving, incredible survivor that was my role model and that woman that told me you can do anything that you want to do. So I can think of no better way today than to say thank you, Aunt Peg, for being that wonderful role model and that perfect survivor and example for me. Um, thank you so much for all of you for being here today and allowing me to share my story with you. And remember, be the change you wish to see in this world. Here. And I, I'm like, I can't use this book. Um, so I have no idea what I just talked about. Um, but uh, uh, for those of you that may have questions about um, what I went through, but before we move to that, I, I want to say one thing. My best friend is here with me today. And I've been single, and I've been through everything as a single mom. But Leslie, you are my sunshine, and thank you for getting me through everything. You're better than any other husband could be. <laughs> I'm a reporter, so I always have questions. <laughs> the, uh, C Cynthia? Yes. Is I haven't seen the documentary yet. I'd like I'd like to see it. Perhaps I shouldn't ruin it. But is is her death in in, in the documentary? Did yes. it? It is. Yes. It, oh, yeah. yeah. Are you still in touch with her family? Um, I I know her boyfriend um, and her father. That was it. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess I was very thorough in my story. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Judy, we're going to have you stay up here. Okay. Hello? That's all right. Yeah. Um, we're going to have Dee Dee stay up here for a second. Dr. Simpson would like to um, give her something. Thank you for an incredible story. Incredibly moving. Thank you. And for your advocacy, selflessness, and your bravery, we would like to present you with this Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, it, 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 it's just incredible how inspiring this has been and for survival for so many people. And the, it's engraved to read the 2018 Breast Cancer Summit presents a Lifetime Achievement Award to Dee Dee Ricks, breast cancer survivor, public health advocate for being an enabler of equality and by navigating for the less fortunate. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> To each of our speakers, we could not be more appreciative of your participation in today's program. Thank you for all the information you have shared with us all today. In addition, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to each of our sponsors for their incredible generosity and dedication to breast health education and awareness. I specifically would like to thank Allergan for their generosity as our presenting sponsor. Thank you as well to K98.3 and Connoisseur Media for helping us spread the word about this event. Once again, if you weren't able to have your question answered, you have the comment card on your table. You just leave the handwriting up, and we'll take those from you. On behalf of myself and Long Island Plastic Surgical Group, we hope that you enjoyed today's program, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.